Good evening and good morning, uh, wherever you are. Uh, welcome to uh, the USC School of Architecture uh, Fall 2020 Digital Lectures and Event Series. I'm Milton Curry, Dean of the USC School of Architecture and Della and Harry McDonald, Dean's Chair in Architecture. USC School of Architecture is a premier global design school. Drawing from the dynamic urban environment of Los Angeles, USC Architecture is committed to making a tangible difference in its community and throughout the world. Through a range of programming and led by purpose-driven faculty and students, USC Architecture fosters a greater understanding of the complexity of our ever-changing and ever-evolving urban landscape. We embrace a multidisciplinary approach that encourages architecture students, scholars, and practitioners to find meaning in their role as citizens, influencers, and advocates across a range of architectural practices now and into the future. It's no secret that USC is situated in the dynamically diverse city of Los Angeles, positioned west towards the Pacific Rim and inextricably connected to our neighbors South in Mexico and Latin America. With a statewide population that draws from Black Americans who ventured west to migrate from the American South, Mexicans, Mexican Americans, Chicanos, and Latinx populations representing the full diaspora of South and Latin America, the indigenous population, an Asian diaspora from Japan, China, and South Asia, and white European immigrants. USC in Southern California is truly a multiplicity of cultures and identities. Building on this reality of the emerging American story and our closer connectivity to our global neighbors, West and South, USC Architecture is launching the Asia Cities Initiative and Latin America's Cities Initiative in order to marshal our intellectual capital to speculate, theorize, and better understand these global phenomena and to make our students intelligently worldly. Tonight's program focused on Asia cities is presented in partnership with the USC Board of Counselors and the Asia Cities Initiative. Indeed, new methodologies need to be deployed to increase equitable distribution and access to public goods and resources, diversify housing supply to address cultural and economic nuances of regional populations. And our school is committed to utilizing design studios increase global study abroad and partnership programs to investigate Asia's megacities, spatial mappings of access to public goods, services, public and civic space, mappings and understandings of urban mobility and public transport infrastructures, and analyses of economic development connected to urban design and the aesthetics of space. Consider tonight's panel as a down payment on many more events and activities to come in this regard. Tonight, I'm very excited with the panelists that we've assembled. They include some of Asia's top architects and developers, uh, global top architects and developers. And I'll give them each several minutes to describe a project that represents the work of their respective companies. We'll then have an open conversation about how their work and activities relate to one another, issues that cut across different cities and those that are city specific, and what lessons can be drawn now and for the future in terms of high-end consumer behaviors, urban housing, physical retail and hospitality, co-living, the role of the arts, culture, and civic space. And then I'll point to, I'll go to the chat room and Q&A and take questions from the audience and continue the discussion. I wanna briefly introduce our panelists in the order that they will speak to us. And I wanna start with Grace Chung, co-founder and principal at X-Range Architects. Grace was born in Malaysia, immigrated to Canada. She holds a master's in architecture from Columbia University. She's a US licensed architect with extensive international experience from Pat Cow Architects in Vancouver, Bernard Chumi Architects in New York, and OMA Asia in Hong Kong and Rotterdam. All this before co-founding X-Range in Taipei in 2003. X-Range is a design practice that encompasses master planning, architecture, landscape and product design, to establish a critical and imitable voice with the methods and materials of architecture. Grace also serves as vice chairman of the Hong, Hong Foundation and has initiated ground, groundbreaking support programs for contemporary art uh, to great acclaim since 2015. Kenny Gaw is president and managing principal of Gaw Capital Partners. 
He graduated with a Bachelor of Science degree, magna cum laude from Brown University in 1992, and then went to work at Goldman Sachs. Subsequently, he co-founded Gaw Capital Partners in 2005 and is currently president and managing principal. Gaw Capital has raised equity in excess of 14.2 billion US dollars so far and currently commands assets of 24.8 billion US under management. Gaw Capital is uniquely is a uniquely positioned global private equity real estate fund management company. The firm has raised commingled funds targeting the greater China and Asia Pacific regions since its inception and manages opportunistic funds in Vietnam and the US along with the Pan-Asia Hospitality Fund and European Hospitality Fund. Notable transactions under his direction include acquisition and repositioning of Pullman Hotel G, Pattaya, and Pullman Hotel G, Bangkok, Thailand, AIA Tower in Macau and Global Gateway, 68 Yi Wu Street building and Club Lusitano building and Kowloon City Plaza. Since 1994, Kenny has been managing director of Pioneer Global Group, a Hong Kong based investment holding company on the Hong Kong Exchange. Adriel Chan is in Hong Kong as well. He holds an EMBA jointly awarded by the Kellogg School of Management at Northwestern University and a BA in International Relations from the University of Southern California. Since 2010, Adriel is Executive Director of Hong Lung and Hong Lung Properties, where he has held roles in finance, leasing, and project management, and was appointed to the board in 2016. He is responsible for development and design, project management, cost controls, and chairs of sustainability and enterprise risk management committees. Adriel is a member of the Executive Committee of the Real Estate Developers Association of Hong Kong, Advisory Council of Hong Kong University of Science and Technology Business School and Committee of Overseers of Morningside College at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Stephen Wong is licensed. I'm back. <laughs> Stephen Wong is a licensed architect in California and holds a master's degree from the GSB Graduate School of Business at Stanford University, where he was a Sloan Fellow. He holds bachelor's degrees in business administration and architecture from the University of Southern California. Stephen is the chairman of Chong Bang Group in Shanghai and managing director of Chong Bang's parent company, Edward Wong Development Company Limited. Based in Shanghai, Stephen is responsible for the overall planning, finance and operation, real estate investment and development activities. Since the 90s, Stephen has been a catalyst for the group's investments in China, US and Canada. In Shanghai, Chong Bang was one of the early investors and partners of the Shu On land, now listed on the HK Stock Exchange. In the US and Canada, the group has been active in both investment and development activities through its wholly owned subsidiaries, the Atelier Group of Companies. Stephen is a non-executive director for HSBC Bank in China, a member of the advisory board of the Stanford Sloan, Sloan Program, Graduate School of Business, a member of the Board of Counselors, proud member of the Board of Counselors of the, of the USC School of Architecture and the USC Price School of Public Policy. Ladies and gentlemen, our panelists today, and I'm pleased to welcome them and have them with us and look forward to the discussion. And I want to start uh, with inviting Grace Chang to give us some remarks. Oh, okay. So I'll go first. Um, let me just break to my slide. Does anyone see me? Um, yeah, okay. Uh, just to give everyone a brief int introduction uh, to some of our projects. We have been in Taiwan for 17 years and our work is really quite varied. Um, we have done single family homes, uh, boutique uh, resort uh, to high tech headquarters, uh, residential complexes. We have also done a large urban block renewal and reuse public landscape projects, large scale urban installations, uh, bespoke pavilions, and even currently a spatial theater and stage set. Um, I think I wanna uh, kind of bring, bring it up that practicing in Taiwan has really allowed us to build on a very rich body of ideas and expressions. Um, I think the more humane pace of Taiwan, direct access to manufacturing or making, diverse microclimates, uh, grand landscapes uh, with earthquake, and strong cultural heritage. I think all this uh, definitely enable us to create projects that would not have been possible outside of Taiwan. Um, for today's talk, I want to share two projects with everyone. Um, these are still working projects, uh, work in progress. 
Uh, the two projects presents uh, very exciting opportunities, not just from an architectural or development view, but also from an urban and cultural aspects. Um, so the first one is the Sky Taipei project. Um, it's in the heart of Taipei, most upscale international area, the Xinyi district. It's currently under construction. It will have two five-star hotels in there, the Park Hyatt and Yandas. It's a $100 million project involving several architects. Um, so our portion of the design is actually on the podium level at the third and fourth floor, which has been planned as, a, as an F&B, food and beverage floor. Um, our design actually goes beyond the commercial interior to connect to the park directly outside of our, our site uh, via a, um, a pedestrian bridge, which will be connected to um, the skywalk system of the entire Xinyi district. Um, I think our design uh, transforms the park um, into a modern citizen friendship, a friendly place. The goal is to create a rich urban experience. And this idea actually extends into the interior. So inside, this is one of the public plaza, um, one of the mobile eating experiences. Um, and then the sculptural uh, pedestrian bridge that connects to the park, um, which brings us to a, an urban theater where you can sit and enjoy a performance. Um, this theater is also a homage to a very beloved uh, public theater, a, a performance theater that was demolished um, to make way for the redevelopment. So in a sense, it's really giving back to the city. And there is also uh, water play, um, wild, wildflower valley in the heart of the city um, to make this uh, a connected and enjoyable um, urban experience. Um, so I think here the discussion is really about creating a dynamic, authentic urban experience rather than just uh, interior styling or making themes for 150 restaurants and eateries. So reviving the park as a public focus with the end goal of encouraging the retail business uh, to better succeed and thrive long term, I think it's really um, a win-win scenario. And there is also going to be public art program on the site. Um, so it's actually a very exciting project for us because it really uh, the first time uh, putting everything together. So the interior, the retail, um, a kind of public aspect to the park. Um, so we're quite uh, excited about this project. So hopefully as time goes on and a couple of years, we'll have more to show. Um, the second project I want to share is slightly a bit larger. Um, it is a, uh, a new city development that will have about eight to 10 towers. Um, we are starting to develop a master plan for it. The site is in New Taipei City. It's about 20 minutes from downtown Taipei. For those of you who's been to Taipei, it's basically the big area in the yellow circle. So the outside area is largely called New Taipei City. Um, a client is a multinational billion dollar company that has been in Taiwan for 50 years. So after moving their factories out of Taipei, they want to rezone the land as commercial and residential development. Um, so we started the project in May, but by June, debates and discussions on a new type of urban space um, has already exploded all over the world. So as you can see here, these are from Paris's 15 minute city. So from London to Paris, urban institutes to, uh, to mainstream media. So there are calls for rethinking our cities ideas of the 15 minute city where everything is within walking distance, human scale, uh, diversify services. So with an eye on this future trend, our client has really commissioned us to explore new ideas of working and living specific to Taipei and to pr propose new types of urban spaces and possibly typologies for the future. Grace, so here, I think you're, sorry, your, uh, your slides are not advancing. Um, okay. Where are we at now? We're still in the first slide. slide. First slide? Yeah. Oh my God. Um, um, so what to do? <laughs> let me try again. Did you try restarting it? Sorry. Yeah, so let me stop share. Um, share screen. Let me share again. Mm, okay, we can see the whole thing. Okay, is it going on? Yeah. Right, you uh, see? Advance to the next one. It's already advanced. Oh, hmm. no, it's not. Uh-oh. 
So, any ideas what to do here? Escape. Try again. Well, here we can see the whole the whole row of slides. Okay. You know what? Let's do this. Let's. It's not ideal, but can anyone see it? Yes. Uh, we can see the whole. We can see about twelve slides. Um. Seventeen slides. Oh, why is it not working? Uh, anything? Okay. I've well, been the first uh, There's a mess for sure. There's so a mess. Grace, there's a Grace, there's a message here that says if you stay in PowerPoint and not hit play, you have to stay in the PowerPoint keynote mode and not hit play. And not hit play. Yeah, yeah, just don't hit play. You'll have the column oh, of slides okay. on your left. So uh, can, can anyone see it now? Is there a slideshow mode? Or? There, there is, but obviously it's not advancing. That's, that's not bad. Can you see it? That works, yes. We can, Does that work? That works, yes. Okay. All right, so just briefly, some of our projects. Um, and then, so the project that I was sharing, this is the Taipei Sky Tower project. Um, and so our design portion really um, involves an interior going to a park uh, via a pedestrian bridge that will connect to the entire city urban walk system. Um, the idea is to um, revive the park and therefore bring in more foot, tra foot traffic um, and create a kind of public focus um, in the heart of Xinyi District, which is the most upscale uh, neighborhood of Taipei. So some of the highlights uh, in the project. So we have a public plaza inside, um, mobile eating experiences, um, sculpture bridge that brings you to the park below, and an urban theater. Um, so the theater, as I mentioned earlier, is really a homage to a performance theater that was demolished to make way for the new development. So this is a way to kind of give back to the city. Um, there's also water play, um, some wildflowers in the heart of the city. Um, so again, as I mentioned earlier, so this is a, a kind of putting together an authentic urban experience um, it, as, a, as a way to make sure the retail business has a greater chance to survive. So I think it's really um, a win-win situation from, from a kind of urban and cultural standpoint. Um, so the next project that I was going to share, hang on a second. Okay. So um, as I mentioned before, this is a project that is, uh, will have about eight to 10 towers. It is outside of Taipei City. Um, for those of you who've been here, it's about 20 minutes away. Um, the client is a multinational uh, billion dollar company. It's been in Taiwan for 50 years and they're moving their factories outside uh, of the city and to rezone this land for commercial and retail. Um, so we started the project in May. And so by, by June, there are all these ideas uh, bubbling uh, all around the world. So from um, the, the mayor of Paris, from to London, urban institutes, uh, mainstream media, they're all talking about um, ideas for new living, uh, new urban living and working, the 15 minute city, uh, where everything is within walking distance, human scale, diversified services. Um, so with an eye on the future, our client has really instructed us to explore ideas of working and living specific to Taiwan and to propose new types of uh, typologies. Uh, so we are now looking into uh, some of the Taiwan paradigm uh, for urban living and working. For example, uh, the patio shop houses, which are basically a combination of street patio, shop or work and home. And also embedded within its form, they're like cross ventilation, courtyards, um, organic roof line, which are all traditional responses to mitigate density and climate. Um, and also uh, our multifunctional street. Um, this has really been uh, a part of how the city uh, has worked for, for, for years. Um, for those of you who's been to Taiwan, I'm sure you've seen some of this. Um, the street alleys are really where, um, where the lifeblood of the city is. 
Um, and so as we move forward, um, we'll be looking into uh, mixtures of living and working scenario, uh, co-living, regen housing, uh, high-end condos with river views, mid and family housing, community art centers, well-being facilities, et cetera. I think this new city cannot be just a green city, because obviously it's no longer enough, uh, but a green city that can unite uh, some, some of our traditional wisdoms and our cultural future. So in essence, uh, a place where we can all work and live. Um, so these are the two projects that um, for me today. So sorry about the slide mishap. <laughs> no oh, I hope that wasn't too troublesome. Thank you. Fantastic, Grace. Thank you. Uh, Kenny? Okay, hope it works for me. Wait, Wait a minute. <laughs> How do I get out of this? Okay. Uh, I'm trying to get to my, my own screen. How do I get out of this? Uh, oh, hey. Okay, this is two screen. Sorry. Oh, I did this. And then, Share screen. There you go. Are you seeing my screen or no? No slides. Not yet. Are you seeing my screen? Uh, no, not yet. Hmm. That's a problem. Okay, share screen. Are you seeing my screen? Not no. yet. Hmm. That's a problem. Um, I'm pressing the share screen button, right? And then you have to select one of the windows, I think. There's a small pop-up and you select which, which screen you want to share or which window you want to share. Yeah. There we, there we go. go. Yeah, See got it. it. Yeah. Okay, good. All right, um, so I'm not gonna really introduce myself because um, uh, Dean Curry already did. Um, ah, shoot, how do I advance now? <laughs> okay, um, but this is just some of the projects we have done. Um, basically, we invest pretty much across the entire spectrum of real estate, from office buildings to shopping malls to hotels uh, to industrial um, warehouse and data centers. But today I wanna to talk about um, an interesting project of ours, maybe it's not as um, fancy or glamorous, uh, but I think it's pretty interesting from an urban redevelopment uh, standpoint. Uh, it's a big portfolio of community malls in Hong Kong, which is attached to uh, public, housing, uh, public housing estates. So just to give people context, I want to give a brief history of public housing in Hong Kong. Basically from uh, 1945 to 1949, during the Chinese Civil War, after the Second World War, a lot of um, immigrants or refugees moved from China to Hong Kong. And they lived all over Hong Kong in a lot of these uh, shanty towns. And a big fire destroyed one of the big shanty towns called Shakit May uh, in 19 1953. And that was the birth of the public housing project in Hong Kong when the government built a uh, public estate uh, on top of that site uh, to house the homeless. And over the years, the Hong Kong government continued to build a lot of these housing uh, and up to 1997, uh, approximately half of Hong Kong's population live in these uh, public housing projects. And the population here are generally working class to lower middle class um, uh, type residents. So it makes up a big part of the social fabric of Hong Kong. Um, and, but this building of uh, public housing stopped around 1998 uh, during the Asia financial crisis when the public housing, uh, when, the, when the private housing uh, market collapsed. So the government put, on, put a moratorium on the uh, construction uh, of these public housing, and that lasted until, um, I would say, about five years ago. Uh, and that kind of sowed the seeds of a lot of the rising housing crisis um, uh, and, and also the, uh, the, the, pub, the private housing prices also going through the roof, creating a lot of um, social unrest uh, and protest, which we saw last year. Um, and in these uh, public housing estates, um, even though the government stopped building, by 2016, um, still about 45% of Hong Kong, Hong Kong population live in these uh, public housing. 
and that's about 3.3 million people. And within these public housing, in addition to uh, the accommodation, there are also a lot of retail centers. Pretty much in all of the uh, major housing estates, there are retail centers, which were originally designed as an integral part of the residential communities. And they provide kind of day-to-day -day retail needs uh, and also recreational spaces. Um, and uh, because they were subsidized by the government and essentially run as uh, government facilities, um, they were typically poorly maintained and operates uh, very inefficiently, but they charge uh, well below market rents. And because of that, it actually makes for a high potential for uh, asset, advancement, uh, asset enhancement. Uh, also, a lot of these estates uh, are built uh, in congested urban areas, um, and they're all very well connected to public transport systems. So in 2005, when the Hong Kong stock market was launching the uh, Real Estate Investment Trust product, the government hived off uh, 151 of these retail facilities from the housing, community, housing authority and put it into a new company called the Link REIT. Uh, and th there were 150 of these facilities plus 79,000 parking spaces. That again makes up a big part of the parking space, uh, public parking space in Hong Kong. This company was listed at the, in uh, 2005 at a valuation of 2.8 billion. Uh, and over the next decade, it underwent major asset enhancement project, asset enhancement works uh, on a lot of these properties. Not all of them, but maybe a, to a third of them. Uh, and just during that, um, the latest valuation has risen to 16 billion. So financially, this has been a very successful uh, enterprise. However, it has also been quite controversial. Um, there's been a lot of uh, protests uh, in the society about the high rents that they charge and also the dominance of large chain stores in these uh, malls uh, and the disappearance of the mom and pop stores in the, in the uh, old neighborhood. So basically, uh, the backlash over, it's a backlash over gentrification, something that we have seen not just in Hong Kong, but uh, also uh, in other parts of the world. So because of that, the, um, the link read have decided to basically stop uh, doing a lot of these asset enhancement work, but selling the assets uh, to other investors uh, and they we divert the, the proceeds to other, other parts of the world uh, as investments. And that's where we came in. In the last two years, uh, we bought in two, two big transactions, 29 of these shopping malls uh, in a total transaction size of about close to 4.5 billion US dollars. And these malls that we bought, uh, 29 malls spread across nine districts in Hong Kong. As I said, 4.5 billion US dollars. Total GFA of 3.3 million square feet. Uh, 15,000 uh, leases and uh, 13,000 car park spaces. And it serves around a uh, immediate population of 400,000 people, not including all the surrounding population around these estates. And um, these are all built beneath uh, public housing estates. Uh, the catchment, as I said, is lower middle class to working class population with very strong daily traffic flow. Um, and many of these have uh, rooftop recreational facilities, which I'll talk about later. And the trade mix is typically uh, supermarkets, uh, fresh food markets, convenience stores, uh, mom, mom and pop uh, type of restaurants um, and other shops. And uh, because of the context of where um, all the criticism uh, in society about what Link we did, we had a hard thought about what we want to do. So our goals, so first of all, we want to make this a, a project of revival. So revival an old community. So there will be new designs and uh, new attractions, but we are not going to throw out the old neighbor, throw out the old neighborhood. Uh, second is we want this to be a, an inclusive place. So this would be um, welcoming to visitors, but most importantly, it's going to be a place for the community that lives there. And lastly, we want this to be a social place. Uh, so it won't only be a place for uh, commerce but also as a gathering place for the community to, uh, to play and to enjoy. And we also came up with a brand uh, for this uh, group of um, uh, shopping malls. Uh, we put a place called People's Place. And in Chinese, it's called uh, Man Fong in Cantonese. So Man means people or citizen, and Fong means uh, gathering place. And in terms of product, we uh, wanted to build community hubs. So like I said, it's a, uh, it's uh, hubs for the community to play and to enjoy uh, and to shop and to uh, uh, live the daily lives. And uh, some of the examples. So this is actually a place that Dean Curry, uh, I took Dean Curry for lunch 
uh, it used to be a nondescript metal panel box. Uh, we turned it into a container park uh, theme uh, shopping mall. And this uh, design theme also extends to the interior, uh, this uh, container theme and industrial theme. And some of the empty spaces, we also, we also decorated with the same kind of design concept and also put benches uh, for local residents to rest uh, in the comfort of uh, air conditioning space. Uh, another photo of the old to new. Uh, and this is the interior of the old uh, wet market area. You can see there are a lot of uh, empty stores already uh, in the past, uh, which we have turned into a vibrant, fully air-conditioned, uh, modern uh, fresh food market. And on the other side of it, we turn it into a large uh, food court with a large vari variety of uh, food choices. The number of uh, eating spaces went from two in this entire mall to 16 um, uh, different kind of restaurants and eating places after we did the renovation. Uh, and we also made sure we kept some of the old uh, popular stores. So this is a uh, old newspaper stand, which has been there for decades. Uh, and we made sure that we brought them back into our new, uh, new space. Uh, this is another one of the old store, which has been there for like 30 years, uh, selling like hardware and household, and household goods. We also brought them back. Uh, this is actually an, a separate building, which used to house an old uh, Chinese restaurant, oversized Chinese restaurant, which is not doing very good business. Uh, with the food court bring, bringing in all the new restaurants, we feel that we don't really need this anymore. We turned this into a uh, senior citizen care center, uh, plus an NGO, which, um, which gives vocational training to uh, unemployed women and uh, housewives. This is another of our malls, uh, which we just opened uh, a month and a half ago, called Siuhei. This is how it looked in the past, and this is how it looks now. Uh, these are old uh, badminton courts. You can see there are not even nets on them. So pretty much nobody use them. We turn them into a multi-purpose uh, recreational space with uh, sitting areas for people also, when they go into the, um, in, uh, to the food court, they can bring out food and eat here also. Another picture of uh, what we did. And this is how it looked inside, inside this uh, wet market area, which we turned into a modern food court. And this is how it looks now and how it looks in the past and how it looks now. Um, again, part of this model which we uh, upgraded. Oh, and this is uh, another one of the old shops which was very popular with local residents. Uh, again, we brought them back into the, uh, to the new space. This is another one of our malls uh, called Hans. In fact, this is the Hans Market, which, um, which Linkreed actually upgraded, uh, but we found that we could still improve on it. And we rebuilt it and into a fantasy land. So this is actually a uh, um, fantasy land, which is also attracting a lot of uh, young people where uh, parents bringing their, their kids to shop as well. Uh, this is how it looked before, and that was, this is how it looked after. And these are some of the examples of the old shops that we brought back. One of the interesting one is this tea house to the right, uh, which is in uh, another one of our malls called the Shackley, uh, in the Shackley Market inside the Shackley Mall. This is a famous um, uh, tea shop in Hong Kong. In fact, we found out after the fact, after we bought these malls, that one of our five-star hotels in Hong Kong, we have a Michelin-style restaurant, um, Chinese restaurant, where the tea sommelier told us that this is the place he goes to to buy uh, premium tea. So we also kept this shop uh, in this uh, old shopping mall. Um, and in addition to the shopping mall and the markets, we also put a lot of emphasis into upgrading uh, the sporting facilities. So the first project we did is called a Kaiye uh, Recreational Area, Recreational Center. Uh, and this is a very famous uh, street, basketball, street basketball venue uh, because of this iconic uh, cage-like architecture. Um, for, the, for its fans, they call, them, they call this place the, uh, the Golden Cage. So for the Golden, for the golden Cage, uh, what we decided to do is we want a theme of our Hong Kong and our basketball home, home ground. And the idea is to use uh, placemaking plus street vibe uh, to renovate this court. And with this, uh, for this purpose, we worked with uh, One Byte, which is an up and coming small Hong Kong uh, design firm. And also Slap, which is a, uh, a group of uh, Hong Kong uh, young people who's, who grew up in these public estates. And they are also street basketball uh, fans. They published a book about all the street basketball venues across Hong Kong. So we work with these two groups to, um, to reposition this uh, sport court. These are some of the pictures. Uh, 
before and after. This is how it looked before, and this is how it looks now, before and after. And this has been rebuilt into a multi-purpose recreational space for children and also uh, uh, outdoor, as an outdoor gym. And for this, we won the 2019 uh, Urban Land Institute Asia Pacific Award of, uh, Award of Excellence. Uh, and this, I think, is the only project that, uh, from public housing project that ever won this uh, award. Uh, this is another project we, which we did uh, in Siuhei, uh, an old sports ground that we renovated. How it looks now. And before and, um, and after. And this has become, this was actually also just opened about a month and a half ago and has been a very uh, popular Instagram, Instagram spot in Hong Kong. A lot of people are taking drone shots of these, uh, these courts. And then uh, in addition to building the courts, we also want to make sure we have community engagement. So this one, we're running a uh, youth empowerment program in, at our Siuhei court, which we just renovated. Another one of our in important initiative is we, we started a, uh, a local basketball league uh, for young high school students. For the first season, we have eight teams that came from, each of them came from a different of these public estates. Uh, and this photo came from the, uh, the final day, which is the, the final playoff event. Uh, and this is a team that I sponsored uh, called the Meng Tuck Warrior. And uh, we won the uh, first, running, first runner up award from this uh, tournament. If you look at the, um, the board in the back, you can also see a lot of uh, large corporates like UBS, White & Case. Uh, they're all sponsors of, uh, of, this, uh, of this league, each of them sponsoring uh, a single team. Uh, and because of the success of this event, uh, this coming season, we're gonna have, we're gonna grow this league from eight teams to 24 teams. And each of the team are coming from uh, different housing estates. And each of them will have uh, corporate sponsors. Uh, and these are the, these, these are the uh, uh, event calendar from the last two months during the summer. As you can see, it's uh, populated with uh, young sports, youth uh, sports training program and also a uh, Red Bull half court championship. Uh, some of the future projects, uh, this is a fisherman wharf uh, theme project in Ablei Chow next to a fishing community. Uh, this is um, next to uh, one of the oldest uh, temples in Hong Kong called Chai Kong Liu. And that's why we built it as a, um, as a uh, temple theme. Uh, and this is a play, uh, this is in Shackley Market and the play on nostalgic Hong Kong. So building a, a new space, uh, look at, making it to look uh, old. And these are projects coming up in the next few months. So hopefully that gives you a uh, good sense of uh, what we're trying to do here. Thank you. Thank you, Kenny, that's great. Adriel? Thank you, Dean Curry. Um, very good to see you all. Let me try to share my screen. Is this uh, showing up? Yep. Yes. And let, let me try playing this and uh, we'll see if that works out. All right, so are you guys seeing this all right? Is it moving? Yes. Okay, perfect. So um, my name is Adriel Chan. Uh, I'm a USC grad, very proudly so. So uh, welcome fellow Trojans. Um, I'll start off really quick by just blasting through some of our projects. Um, it's just photos, uh, not too much text. This is a map of China with the cities that uh, we're present in. Um, you'll notice it's mostly along the coast, which is where most of the commercial activity takes place. Uh, we're right now in 11, 10 cities with, with uh, about 11 projects in mainland China, plus a portfolio here in Hong Kong. Um, this is a Grand Gateway. This was built in, nine, opened in 99, uh, and it was recently renovated just uh, two years ago. This is an interior. This is also in Shanghai, Plaza 66. Uh, most of our projects are retail malls uh, or mall anchored and mixed use projects. This is an interior of Plaza 66. Uh, Palace 66 this is in Shenyang, um, which is up in the northeast of, chi uh, of China. It's roughly at the same latitude as Connecticut. Um, I'm going to come back to this in a second because there's something, uh, you know, really relevant, I think, to architects in this. Uh, Park 66, this is in Jinan. Um, Jinan is the uh, capital city of the province of uh, Shandong, which is where Qingdao beer comes from. 
uh, for those of you who appreciate Qingdao. Uh, Forum 66, this is another project of ours in Shenyang. This is a hotel and an office uh, on the left, as you can see on top of a luxury mall on the bottom. It's an interior uh, center. This is in Wuxi, which is also offices and retail. Uh, this is Riverside 66. I'm gonna come back to this one in a little bit more detail in a second as well. Uh, it looks like either a big, uh, cucumber or a dagger, depending on you know, what you're predisposed to seeing. Uh, this is just a retail shopping mall. This is the interior. Um, Olympia, this is up in Dalian, uh, which is a different city in Liaoning province, also in the Northeast of China, where it does get very cold. Uh, this is an interior shop. Spring City, this is Kunming. We just opened this last year. Uh, this is something I'm really proud of. This is a KPF project, for those of you who uh, are looking at architects, architecture firms. Uh, Peak Galleria, this is a project here in Hong Kong, the only one I'll kind of cover. Uh, Heartland, this is Wuhan, where uh, a lot of you will have now heard of because of COVID. Um, this is something that we've been building. And uh, during even this pandemic, we've been, uh, it's been a challenge, but it's really interesting. So this is opening up uh, later this year. Uh, and then this is one that's still in, in, under construction. This is in Hangzhou. Uh, which is in Zhejiang province, which uh, is under construction and hopefully will open in a couple of years. So I'm going to jump back quickly to Palace. This is in Liaoning province. Uh, like I said, it's roughly the same latitude as Connecticut. Um, it's a beautiful structure. It echoes the old Chinese palace, which is next door to it. Um, and you can kind of see that in the roof lines. But um, if you look at this Shenyang up in the far northeast, you know, what, what this is, uh, is a glass ceiling. Uh, with these beautiful louvers, uh, which are supposed to be automated and uh, which move to provide sunlight and shade uh, at the appropriate times. Um, there's some PV panels on the roof as well, but it's basically a glass roof. Um, the facade is mostly glass as well, as you can see. Uh, it's, of course, a shopping mall, so you need to be able to see what's inside uh, the mall and you want that interaction between the, the content and the passerbys, passersby. And, I mean, this is kind of weird, uh, you'd think, have you seen any buildings in the, the latitude of Connecticut, uh, which are completely glass curtain and uh, glass ceilinged? Um, you know, th this is one of the fundamental issues in uh, architecture, you know, it's their context, what's your context? And the weather here gets down to negative 30 degrees Celsius, which is about negative 22 Fahrenheit. Uh, and to have a glass ceiling is just kind of ridiculous. Um, so this is going to be a, a pretty unconventional presentation. I'm actually going to highlight on some of the strange decisions that uh, my predecessors and our designers have made. Um, so with negative 30 degrees Celsius, you definitely don't want uh, glazing or you want as little glazing as you can get away with uh, to retain heat and to reduce your energy bills. Um, so this is something that, you know, I've seen where our designers have uh, not taken the context either fully into account or uh, sufficiently into account. Um, next is the Riverside. So in Tianjin, this is uh, not quite as far north, but it still gets down to uh, negative uh, 10, 15 degrees in the winter. This is also a completely glass uh, facade. It's all curved. Um, you know, this is kind of ridiculous when you think about it. Um, it's beautiful and I love the way it looks. It's won numerous architecture awards, um, but it just isn't practical. One thing uh, which is even kind of more ridiculous about uh, what we have in Tianjin is if you look at this map, you see the river um, up here, which, and this is a photograph, this is the river, and then this is our project. You know, you have to ask, you know, we're, we're this far from the river. Uh, there is a history of this river overflowing and flooding the neighborhood, um, yet we've chosen to create a product where you can see the glass, it comes all the way down to ground level. There's no steps, there's no grade change uh, here as well in the front. You can see that people walk completely seamlessly in. This is great for customers um, and really good for the brands, but not really good when the river is flooding once a year. Um, and so, you know, th this has become an issue where we've had to install floodgates and, uh, uh, additional uh, provisions to protect the asset from uh, natural disaster or otherwise what would be normal flooding. 
Um, another issue I want to talk about uh, very quickly on this floor plan is, you know, this is what it looks like uh, on plan. You'll notice that it's very long and very narrow, uh, but the plot uh, is a little bit wider. It kind of points up in, in the north. Um, while this is beautiful uh, architecturally, and it provides a really interesting, uh, you know, both sight lines and also a landmark for the city, you know, you look at it from a leasing perspective. So we operate our projects. It's very small and narrow shops along the left side, the narrow side, uh, and, a, and a couple, only a few larger shops, both in the belly in the center and towards the right side. Um, and retail, uh, for those of you who, who have learned a little bit about it, you know, you need that floor space, you need that shelf space, uh, you need space that's inviting and that allows people to browse and walk. And generally speaking, those spaces are not going to be just a few meters deep. Uh, you need much deeper and bigger spaces for that. So um, this is something that looked beautiful on floor plan and in renders, but in practical uh, operations has been sort of challenging. Um, so, you know, these are a couple of things that I wanted to run through very quickly. Um, on the other hand, one thing that we do have uh, is in the bottom right corner, you see this little um, gray box. This is part of our management, but not part of our ownership. So what that is, is a old uh, bank. This was from, I believe, the 1800s. Um, it's a historic building, so it's under protection, uh, which means there's, big, there's a lot of regulation about what you can and cannot do, what you can and cannot touch, how the space can be used. Um, on the left, that's what it looked like while we were under construction. And on the right is uh, what, what it looks like basically today. Um, you'll notice that it's actually, we've turned a, a large part of it into a Starbucks. Um, this is the interior uh, before and after. Uh, I think I give a lot of credit to the Starbucks architecture and real estate team for coming up with such a beautiful uh, design. They've used a lot of the existing structure as much as they could. Um, they've had to do a lot of unusual protection from coatings to, uh, uh, you know, these uh, polyurethane protective layers, um, and uh, they've put in a bar. Uh, I don't know if you can see there in the back in the center, which is really um, a, a great translation and, and reuse of this bank space. So that's something um, I thought was really, really cool. Uh, unfortunately, since I've done that, it will not move anymore. Anyway, so um, that's a very quick overview of our projects and some of uh, the notable points, I think, when it comes to what architects might be thinking about. Um, you know, the, the context, uh, as, as they've learned, is so important and it will always be important and you can never uh, ignore that. Um, so I have a lot of other things that uh, I'd love to talk about and, you know, we can talk about luxury, we can talk about equity. Uh, those two things sound like they're in contrast, but you'd be surprised. I think there are some, some points to, to go down, um, but I know we're running short on time, so I will stop here. I'll pass it to uh, Stephen and then we can get into this in the Q&A. Thank you, Adriel. That's great. Stephen? Stephen? Can you see the screen, guys? Yes, we can see it. Great. Uh, again, thank you, guys. Uh, uh, my name is Stephen Wong, also graduate of USC. Uh, I've been there for a long time and a long time ago. Um, I've decided to take this uh, in a different spin. Is coming in from an architect's point of view as to what development is like and what can we do as an architect to influence development from start to finish and hopefully we can actually implement our ideas, realize our ideas more effectively. Um, so I'm going to take you on a very quick, uh, hold on, let me just slow the screen here. Uh, uh, a visual tour of uh, what we do at Italian Capital Partners at the uh, genetic level and then I'll move on to the corporate issues and then obviously the projects afterwards. So this is what we do as an architect, middle of the night, a lot of drinks, you know, a lot of drawings, a lot of BS, uh, and then we try to do something together. Uh, obviously, we learn how to do buildings and components on buildings. This is Christopher Alexander's uh, pattern language. Um, 
And then we learn about cities, how they are put together. In many ways, this is actually where the genetics uh, of real estate comes in. And then we learn about components, urban proportions, uh, activities on the streets, uh, and modern cities as well, in, in a different scale and proportion as well. And how civic spaces fits in. Obviously materials, uh, integration with, men, uh, with, with the built environment. But what we do, as we all know, are important, but architecture alone, as, as you can see, it's not enough, uh, as Adriel has uh, alluded to, there's a lot more issues at play. So what we learn in architecture is about history, all these typologies, scale and proportions, we know quite well as architects. Um, this is actually a diagram given to me by Mr. Gordon Wu uh, of Hopewell. Uh, he says, Stephen, you know, don't think about architecture because our slice in the food chain is very, very small. It's encapsulated within the yellow lines. Um, but there's a lot of stuff that happens before and after. If you look at the, the red line, it's actually owner's equity being deployed. And he calls it March to Death Valley until you actually finish your project. We assume that, like studio, if you don't get it done, uh, you know, sound on or you're, you're gone, right? So what we do at Italian Capital Partners is actually use architecture as a base. We call it Architecture Plus. It extends our impact uh, beyond, beyond architecture in the value chain by extending it to strategy formulation all the way through development cycle, uh, stabilization, ongoing operation and management, obviously liquidity event. Uh, until you actually reach the end, we are again assume debt. What that involves is actually a whole lot of other things beyond architecture. Uh, as you can see on the list, strategy formulation, you name it, we got it. Uh, so what we have decided to do at that point in time was, uh, this is early, uh, probably late 80s, uh, early 90s is, you know, let's not just do architecture, let's actually become a player in, in development and be an investor, become an operator as well afterwards. So we integrate everything under Italian Capital Partners. And our KPI is actually measured by impacts that we have on, on, on by our project on the community. And we believe if we did it right, money should follow. And these are the cities we're working in right now. And again, uh, cities are all different. So it's quite impossible to generalize. So we localize our strategies accordingly. So let me give you an example of what we do in Shanghai. This is back in the early 2000s. This is actually a view of Shanghai from the, air, uh, from the eye of a pilot. It's a city of 24 to 25 million, you know, more than two thirds of the size of California. And one of the key cities in the, uh, in the world in the 1930s, so it has a lot of history, is the main name, name card for China to integrate back into the world. It's a city going through massive amount of changes. It has a huge wealth gap. So when we actually start looking at Shanghai, you know, the question is how do we how do we approach it? You know, so I, I learned this from the Navy SEALs, you know, uh, how, do you, how does one eat an elephant? Well, we try to do it one bite at a time. It's possible, but you, you can't rush it. So what we did was we actually uh, consolidated our experience in Shanghai. Uh, one of the projects we, we invested in and actually worked in heavily is actually the Xinjiang D project, whom some of you might know. Is a targeted uh, market is actually high-end expatriates, uh, along with offices, re retail, and uh, residential, with a big amenity, uh, public space in the civic space, which is the main make lake in the middle with parking underneath. Here's the Xinjiang D and Taiping Chao project. This is again early 90s, uh, uh, early 2000s, late 90s uh, project, and we actually start implementing that in around 2001. And we offer lifestyle along the way. The question we have at the time is, you know, this is mainly for experts. Can we actually offer that to the locals, which the local market is way underserved? So we came up with the idea of retail anchor mixed use. Uh, we call life ups where people live, work, and play. The question we have at that time was, you know, can our life ups deliver lifestyles to free for all to the locals? Can it be backyards for the local residents? Can we actually deliver product at local pricing as well? At 
uh, in the long run on daily basis? And can we actually start implementing in one of the poorest neighborhoods of Shanghai, which is called Zabi District at that time? Obviously, internally, we came with a whole bunch of KPIs ourselves in, in terms of measuring our successes. Architecturally, financially, and also uh, ongoing management that uh, we need to take on the project in the long run. So this is the Elva version of what we do. Uh, this is a startup with two other architects uh, from USC. Uh, again, uh, life, lifelong buddies. We found the site. This is what <clears throat> this is what the <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, this is what the site looks like uh, in the nineties. It's really a, a city block uh, size with a lot of possibilities around. 350 meters on one side, 400 meters on the other side. So there's a lot we can do. We can't really just master plan it that, uh, you can't really generalize it. I think that's the point. This is actually another site that we, we, we have, because uh, there was a site we bought and we, didn't, we couldn't really figure out how to, um, how to have a good handle of the size and proportion. So we look out the window, here's another block which is precisely the same size as ours. You know, that gives us a, a whole bunch of loose bumps because there's a lot we must do and we, we should do uh, to pay attention to what we can deliver. So what we do is we start thinking about impact, uh, obviously starting with architecture. Uh, I'm gonna run through these slides very quickly in the interest of time. We went through, <clears throat> we went through the whole uh, diagram uh, massing scale and proportions, circulation, uh, civic space design layout. Again, uh, the working models in every space that we have, every level that we have. And again, these are stuff that uh, all of us in the architecture have experienced. Oops, sorry. Modeling, and they obviously went through construction, which we uh, uh, construction managers construction manager as well directly. And in eighteen months, we delivered the project to the locals at their own pricing. And obviously, this project was was one of the ULI uh, 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 global award finalist. Our next project actually won the global award from ULI afterwards in the same idea, and this became the study case for ULI also in two thousand and fourteen. And we check our boxes again, and we pretty much hit every box we have uh, that we laid out in terms of delivery. So you may ask, you know, uh, again, I, 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 I echo what uh, Kenny and Adrian were saying, you know, these, what we do is nothing new. We just part of the evolution. Uh, uh, it is really about evolution of a city. We go back to the basics. If you look at the painting by old Chinese uh, painter uh, in the 11th century circa, um, all the urban living have uh, existed at that time. This is urban living in, this, in different mode, in different format as of today. So like human, city evolves. And what we do at Delhi Capital One is we just focus on incremental change, one project at a time. We're just part of that process. So since then, the project in 2009, Life Up at uh, uh, Chao won the ULI award, again, in the same format, I won't go into details. And we keep delivering and improving on our on our ideas and obviously evolving with the with new technology and everything else. Under construction right now is another life up that we have in Shanghai. Again, in a in a rather uh, in an old neighborhood that's actually developing uh, at a pace that's behind the, the general market. It's a project that we use all our skill sets again, uh, with preservation co that coexists with the new life ups. So the takeaway, the architecture plus idea is, you know, architecture is not enough. And what do we do? And also find a good team uh, that you can stay with and contribute. These are the two books that influenced my career quite a bit. It's actually Pattern Language from Christopher Alexander and also Architects and Developers by John Portman. And that's for me, uh, for everybody's on, on the call, I think in some ways, you know, the architecture plus something else, plus interior, plus construction. There's a whole lot we can do with architecture and architecture training. You find a good team, again, for, uh, like the starlings and, and, and uh, these uh, fish that uh, protect itself, you know, again, 
try to stick together with the team, avoid collisions with one another, swim in the same directions. You create a force that you can actually make some changes with. <clears throat> Again, never ever give up because this process is not supposed to be easy. You know, we are assumed that until we're done. And with that, you can actually achieve new heights. Again, I rushed these slides through quite quickly. Any questions, please feel free to contact me uh, in whatever way you can. Thanks. Thank you all. Thank you, Stephen. Um, really um, an amazing uh, array of projects and strategies. And I think what, what makes um, perhaps uh, this conversation different from from others that might focus uh, strictly on the real estate assets is, is the um, intersection between design and, and also the processes of thinking about um, things like gentrification and so forth. So I wanna ask um, you to contemplate a couple of questions. Um, Grace, you talked about kind of developing authentic urban experiences. And I think Kenny, you talked about um, the way in which the um, government policy, um, you know, in a way producing certain kinds of, of contemporary civic unrest. And um, I guess I want to ask you both and all of you, um, how do you, what tools are you using to perspectively imagine the future of these cities where um, the cross, crossing of classes is something that's not, um, uh, antagonistic, but in fact, um, uh, a natural kind of synthetic organic experience within an authentic urban context. Are you using the tools primarily of design to achieve that or the tools of real estate finance and how you're, how you're financing projects that are, that are as much about the public good as they are about um, making profit? Um, what are the specific tools that you think are the, are are going to pull the levers in the future for advancing a notion of an equitable city where we have all classes living uh, in a certain kind of harmony, but also a certain kind of um, social equity. Shall I go first? Sure. Well, ladies first. <laughs> um, I think um, it's actually a very good question. How do you create that authentic experience? I, I think from from an architect's point of view, really, we're working from the ground up. So I think some of the things that uh, I pay attention to would be the kind of material, um, the solutions that are really embedded in how people use the space. Uh, and very often, you've been to Taipei, and Taipei is really called one of the ugliest cities. Um, but if you really look into how these spaces have been uh, used or appropriated, I think there's a lot of intelligence in it. Um, and so th these are kind of, you know, collected over kind of generations of, over the entire culture. So these are the things I find very interesting. I've actually given a TED talk on it. Um, but so coming back to projects, I think one of the things that, um, a tools that I use would be uh, the materials and the experience that are associated with it um, in a way to try and see if there's a new way to, to redesign or rethink or represent that um, so that it gives people kind of a, a new pride in, in what they have or, or what is already there, but really is something that they could claim their own and, and it's going to be as good as whatever they find in Paris or, or another foreign country. So it's really looking for these um, local intelligence and really giving it that, um, that critical edge, I think, um, in terms of being rigorous about detailing, being rigorous about structure, um, how these materials come together and what they mean to the space and to the texture and experience of it. it it's really, um, it, it's, it's something that I'm always fascinated with. So um, I, I know it's very minute, but I, I think that sort of level of uh, tactile quality actually goes a long way in terms of um, directing uh, how you would experience a place. And, and once you experience a place, um, I think it really it really goes much deeper and and it really affects all of us. Yeah, yeah I, I think uh, from the project that I was talking about um, is one of the first time we th we truly thought about uh, a project in a more holistic way, uh, and and also the context is because we've seen um, 
the change in the society in Hong Kong uh, of what you're talking about that, I mean, in the past, Hong Kong was a place all about profits. So when you build a project, all you think about is, I'm gonna do something new and I'm gonna target these customers and, these cu and because these customers are gonna bring about the best profits for me. They may not be from that uh, region, they may not be from that community, uh, but it doesn't matter because I wanna make the most profits. But because of what has happened in Hong Kong in the last few years, um, I think people need to, or developers need to start to change their thinking. So the project cannot be about only the new customers that you bring in, but there are a lot of people who are living around there that uh, your project would affect. And I think it's the same thing that has happened in, uh, around the world in a lot of uh, gentrification projects. Uh, in the beginning, of course, uh, people applauded it because uh, the streets look more beautiful, uh, there are new buildings going up, uh, crime rates go down, which is a good thing. But after 10, 20 years, people realized communities uh, get displaced. The social fabric changes. So I think uh, developers need to start, start to think about this more holistically, how to balance uh, profits when they bring in the new uh, that also provides, that doesn't uh, throw out the old community or the old neighborhood. Um, the other thing that we found is um, we, are, we are trying to use uh, design and architecture. First, of course, is um, uh, make, make sure it's eye-catching. Uh, and because today there are a lot of uh, social media uh, and when you create something eye-catching, it becomes very Instagrammable uh, and that becomes uh, free advertising for you. So a lot of the projects that we did within this uh, People's Place project has, has that in mind. So there's a lot of place-making type of uh, ideas uh, that creates a lot of Instagram moments. Uh, and we've seen that uh, to be uh, quite successful also through this process. Stephen and Adriel, I want to ask, um, how are you um, seeing the, 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 the relationship between um, the, the aesthetics that are uh, surrounding the context of your properties and your properties? Um, are you elevating, uh, do you find you're elevating rents uh, and, and pricing around your projects, or are you entering into a market that's already priced similar to the product that you're bringing in into market, and then secondly, I do want to follow up on uh, the thought of uh, what can what can we learn? I mean, I'm interested in this oscillation between um, uh, class in the city, and I'm a wonderful array of projects where I think the aesthetics of the kind of super graphics and um, this Instagrammable moments, as as Kenny was talking about, um, and then in a way the aesthetics of luxury is becoming more and more experience-based. And um, I think that in this global capital environment, we, you know, luxury borrows tactics from uh, lower end retail and lower end retail borrows tactics from high end retail. Um, so that's one element that I'd like to kind of delve into. How are you finding um, your projects fitting into the existing uh, context, um, Stephen and Adriel? Did you want to go first? Um, no, no, please. Why don't you start? Okay. Um, I think the, Dean Curry, I think the real question is really about what we're trying to achieve as a, as a, as a team, as a project, as a company, and aligning all the interests that's actually integratable to the local community. And that's actually how a project will survive in the long run. So, you know, in what we do, the aesthetics uh, uh, is actually temporary because we design for flexibility because uh, the market needs to change. The market will change. If you don't, you know, your project will be obsolete. So it's up to the management to be leading that process post-construction to get it done. So obviously, you know, if you look at Piccadilly Circus or other uh, neighborhoods that globally you would, you would like to visit, uh, it changes over time, but the place remains. So I think what we, what we normally do is actually think about not just the temporary aesthetics that we look at, but the scale and proportions. Uh, one thing we found in Berlin, uh, in Germany, for example, in Southern uh, Germany, uh, obviously a lot of building, there's a lot of building codes, uh, there's a lot less building codes, but more buildings are being preserved accordingly. If you look at Berlin, uh, uh, 
some parts of Berlin have the parts of Berlin that has actually a lot of coastal preservation, more stuff get destroyed. So what we believe is actually the market forces will drive the preservation and the aesthetics. So the question for us as architects and development community real estate uh, value chain is how to actually cope and integrate ourselves with that change through time. And if we don't do that, again, I think part of the comment I totally agree with Kenny is uh, if we just, if our KPI is purely profit, we make decision accordingly. If your KPI is actually uh, uh, other things, for example, we actually measure ourselves in terms of housing prices increase for the first alpha version project at Downing, Life Up at Downing. Uh, when we started the project, uh, just for benchmark sake, uh, housing prices were approximately local Roman B four to 5,000 square meter, it doesn't, it doesn't sell. And when we are done, it's selling for 60,000 square meter and you couldn't buy them. Obviously, right now it's closer to 80, 90,000 square meter. So it's really an issue of using those pricing benchmarks as the KPI. Because when when the local actually retain uh, their wealth, they can then spend. Obviously, they can call the place home, so on and so forth. Everything actually integrates to that strategy. Thank you. And just a quick uh, quick comment. Um, I noticed that there's a question from John Dutton, which dovetails very nicely with what Dean Curry had just asked and uh, what we're talking about. So, you know, it's, uh, aesthetics versus context. Um, I think what we build, it tends to be luxury high-end malls. Uh, obviously people associate that with wealth and the wealth gap. Um, but at the same time, I think what, what you, you, in reality, what you notice is that the real estate prices in the adjacent to your projects are actually going up too. So you're helping create wealth for the neighborhood, for the community. Um, this ties in so much with the gentrification and you know how the development of um, communities and urban redevelopment uh, and you know there's this there's this tension there's always going to be this tension between uh, what is charming and authentic and what was and what is economically viable or what is uh, you know business uh, what is good for business um, I think that's about finding that balance between what is charming and uh, you know what's good for the community uh what's good for business and what's uh, good for the environment um so th th these tensions i mean it's it is kind of like luxury um and uh wealth disparity and it's 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 a very complex question with a, a lot of moving parts um but i think that um there is something to be said about developments and uh, the contributions to the development of their um, the economy in their immediate surroundings. Mm -hmm. I wanted to ask two questions. One about preservation, because it, it, it appears in, uh, Stephen, your work, the last project that you showed, and um, Grace uh, in your work and in um, Kenny's work that, uh, and, and actually Adriel in your project as well, the Starbucks, that um, the notion of uh, building a new on a kind of blank slate is something that architects salivate over. Um, at the same time, uh, notions of adaptive reuse have been around for quite a long time. But um, if I could try to connect the, the tactics of preservation uh, with the tactics of limiting dislocation i.e. gentrification and how, how real estate could suture those things together. So uh, a lot of the conversations in this country um, around some approaches to preservation is that, uh, you know, things like land trusts and things like uh, passive equity, uh, um, passive equity investments from, a, from an entity other than, than a developer, um, with the developer as a partner, could help retain people who are living in that community, but also retain some of the authentic fabric of that community while um, increasing um, the value of assets. So um, uh, auctions and, and air rights and uh, uh, things like that, 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 that generate revenue for uh, public entities um, could be there. So I'm wondering, are you um, looking at or thinking about tactics that allow you to use uh, some of the tactics of, of historic preservation, but for actual communities and people, Any, for anyone. I'm gonna go first as uh, 
Well, we're still uh, in development of that idea. Um, but I think one key point to point out is that the second project I share, it, there, there is nothing to preserve on that site. Um, currently, it's just huge metal sheds or factories. Um, but that entire neighborhood is really typical of sort of the, the, the dense urban suburb of Taipei. Um, it's older, you know, uh, it's much more chaotic, it's, it's less planned than Taipei proper. A lot of the buildings are older. Um, so when we look into it, I mean, we were really uh, trying to look for a new way to insert into this kind of giant development. So as opposed to, for example, transporting um, a giant high-end mall, you know, black box or whatever onto there, we felt that there is an opportunity to um, actually engage with the, some of the smaller scale sites. And so the buildings surrounding the site is, is really currently, they're like five to six stories tall. You know, they're typical with the kind of shop houses. So we really wanted to find a way to, um, to rethink and, and modernize um, these, these old wisdom. And plus the site is really in the worst spot uh, in terms of Taipei's heat sink uh, um, kind of problem. So it, it really gets so incredibly hot if you do a climate analysis. So the idea is also to try and work with the wind path and the kind of the, the solar orientation and then take in some of these wisdoms from I mentioned earlier. Um, so for the shop houses, um, there, there's cross ventilation, you know, the form is interesting, it's very organic. Um, people generally live and react better, better to this and plus um, it also allows for a, a lot of variety in terms of experiences. So we are um, looking into how we can give this um, like a modern edge. Like if we are to do this 2020 or 2030, um, what would this type of construction look like? Um, and again, you know, it has to make development sense, uh, which is kind of what I'm excited about because it's not really about keeping something new and renovating it. It is really about uh, innovating and rethinking from the inside out. And, and so I, I, I'm optimistic and I'm really hoping that we would have some very exciting uh, new urban spaces or, or new typologies or combinations uh, to show you guys in the future. Great. Yeah, so um, in our experience, we've actually done quite a lot of um, heritage building uh, preservation. Uh, even in LA, uh, we, we own the Hollywood Roosevelt Hotel in Hollywood, which is a pretty well-known heritage uh, hotel there. Uh, and I'm sure you guys have seen the changes that went through that, that building uh, of adaptive reuse. I think we did, a, and, and we also did a, um, a, one of our first, in fact, our very first project in Shanghai was a uh, um, repositioning of an 80 year old uh, department store plus office building uh, into a modern uh, shopping mall uh, on Nanjing East Road called Plaza 353. Uh, we also did a, um, a renovation of a heritage hotel in, uh, in Yangon in Burma, which is over 100 years old uh, as well. So we did a lot of these projects. I think in the beginning, we did these uh, kind of um, repositioning upgrade projects. Um, also because uh, we come from the, the, the background of um, private equity fund management. So a lot of our uh, uh, KPI is, is tied to finance and is tied to IRR. Uh, and when you have IRR, that means you have a time clock. Uh, every, every year or, or every day uh, makes a difference to your returns. Uh, when, you, when you buy a piece of land, go through planning, build it, stabilize it, by the time you do all that, it's at least five, six, seven years down the road. Uh, and if you, if, you, if you know finance, usually after five years, it's pretty difficult to, to achieve a 25% IRR. So, uh, so just by necessity, we typically go for these um, renovation projects, which takes less time, uh, but there are more restrictions. But the other interesting thing that we found is um, because developers tend to like to do ground up development from scratch, uh, they find these kind of uh, renovation projects too tedious. Uh, and, and it's just not something that they like to do. And because of that, it carves out a niche for us also to go for these projects and we don't see a lot of, uh, a lot of competition. Great. Yeah. I'm going to go, uh, I'm going to combine a couple of questions in the Q&A. Um, and one is, uh, you all received privileged education from Western universities. Uh, have you ever questioned the design approaches you learned 
as being culturally appropriate, sensitive, and authentic to the specific Chinese context? Um, and also, do you see, um, well, it's a question, do you see the presentations as East learns from the West or West can learn from the East? Um, combining a couple questions there. Maybe I'll take a quick stab at this one. Um, so I studied at USC and uh, Kellogg, and, and I think any time you go into a different cultural context uh, or even geography, you know, it, there's a there's a big part of learning and respecting what you've just stepped into. Uh, so when when I moved into mainland China back in the mid 2000s, it was a huge cultural shift. I realized that a lot of the things that I learned, um, well, first of all, you realize outside of school uh, that a lot of what you'd learn isn't directly applicable. You have to make a translation. Um, and it's the same when you walk into a different culture. There's a lot of principles, um, and I suggest that you do stick to your principles, but you have to translate them into something that is relevant locally. Um, when it comes to East learning from West, West learning from East, it's actually, to me, it's actually kind of irrelevant. I think everybody should be learning from everybody. In this context, um, what, you know, the West is the quote unquote West is more developed than the East. And so it's natural for the East to look to what's been done in the West and to, to take away um, what's worked and what hasn't worked. Um, and you know, so what, what I focused a little bit on was what didn't work for us, um, which I think is maybe a bit more unusual. So it, it's really about keeping that open mind and uh, being critical about uh, yourselves and about what you've seen. Um, I'd like to uh, kind of share with you my own experiences. Um, I think Kerry mentioned I actually was born and grew up in Malaysia. So we immigrated to Canada when I was 17. So for 17 years of my life, it's definitely a traditional Asian style of education. In fact, I don't even remember that I could speak English. You know? And so from 17 onwards, then it's all Western education. So I think I really embody uh, the half and half. You know, so if you talk about the kind of East and West, I think that really is me. And then I never thought I would move to Taiwan, uh, but working in Asia and moving to Taiwan. So um, I think when, when you are kind of living um, in this sort of situation, you don't see it as a, as a fight or a conflict, as Adrian just said. I think one of the, one of the most influential thing that I, I, that the thing that influenced me the most is really, um, you know, really looking at how, how Graham Coolhouse, uh, how he approaches uh, what you call non-Western culture and giving it that sort of uh, detail uh, study or observation um, that most Western uh, education would never even bother to look at. And so I think he's already broken many grounds in that. And so I think that has been always an inspiration. And so really establishing in Taiwan, I mean, who, who knows you know, that I would be here and, and have my office here. But I, but I think it really, puts me in a very exciting position in the sense that I can come from all these different angles and really try and create something um, I think that could be very meaningful to, to a large group of cultures uh, or a large group of people. So, um, so I, I actually see this sort of East-West thing as, as an asset. Um, and so that's just um, my thing. That last question was from Mina. I wanna credit people on their questions. Very good question. Um, I'm going to combine a question from Alvin Huang and, and Yo Hakamori. Um, uh, maybe the equitable urban environment is messy, uh, messy to allow for various socioeconomic classes to exist. We see that in many Asian cities as well as here in LA. Uh, perhaps city ordinances need to allow for this hybrid type of use of urban spaces. That's a, a question slash statement. Uh, and, and to add on to that, um, Alvin uh, says that in Asia, there are fairly clear attitudes that retail space doubles, at pu doubles as public space, that shopping malls and retail developments have secondary and tertiary civic uses as public gathering spaces. How are these attitudes incorporated into the design of large scale retail projects in Asia and how can these approaches add to the health and success of the urban condition? So um, the messiness of urban environments, um, providing that equitability and, and the notion of kind of how uh, retail functions in the Asian uh, marketplace. Stephen? It's called cold calling, right? <laughs> um, uh, let, let, me, let me sort of step, take a step back on this. I think the question is really about localization and generalization. We never really, you know, in, in, our, in our search for our strategy formulation, uh, what to do in certain cities, we, I think the first thing we normally do is actually not to look at me, 
is look at us, us meaning the local community and ourselves, what can we create? And one of the examples is actually uh, USC had an Italian Rome program uh, back in our days, you know, and we stay in a little uh, place called uh, uh, Lunetta, and next to it is a place called uh, uh, Piazza Campo di Fiori. Uh, that's where we get our food, local, localize ourselves, get our bread in the middle of the night. You know, it has it has all kinds of stuff. It, the, that place changes about five times a day, into, or even seven times a day in terms of usage. In the lunchtime, it can be lunch place. You know, in the afternoon, it can be a soccer field for, for kids coming back from school. In the middle of the night, it's actually a night market. So I think the real issue is how do you utilize those spaces in the local context? That's actually important. And as architects, can we enable that flexibility to happen? Part of the problem, I think what we see in modern architecture is very specialized usage for a certain type of stuff. You do it over here at a certain point in time. And it's very inflexible from that perspective. So I think in many ways, I think retail urban spaces can also can be very easily integrated. Internally, we have a phrase uh, that we use a lot is organized chaos. Can we actually create that and yet let the city and let the we build a stage and let the, the, the occupants actually do their play? I think there's a whole lot of, a whole lot of work you can do here that's actually quite quite sustainable. There's a question, thanks, uh, coming through of, uh, for all the projects. Is are there uh, from Oscar Wong for all projects? Is there any are there any examples of some type of rapport with the local community? For instance, surveys or seminars that influence the process and design to give a higher degree of civic sense. Um, how do you, um, on the one hand, get get past the public entities that have to approve projects, uh, and and on the other hand, how do you proactively seek uh, community buy-in on the kind of projects that you're doing? Um, I'll, I'll take on that. Um, actually, just on the project that I, um, I showcased just now about these uh, community malls, we actually have had to do a lot of that. Um, as, as I said, some, you know, 45% of Hong Kong population actually live in these uh, public estates. So it makes up a very big part of the, uh, the society of Hong Kong. Uh, and in the local uh, district elections, basically all the, all the elections are done or, or, or all, the, all the votes are basically coming from these uh, housing estates. So in almost all of our shopping malls, there are district councillors, which, which are elected uh, locally uh, by the local residents that represent them. Um, so one of the uh, big jobs of our um, PR marketing department is actually to deal with them. Uh, and instead of dealing with them anta antagonistically, uh, we go and engage them and we talk to them. We understand from them what their constituents want. And we often we work with them. Sometimes, a lot of times it's our ideas. We give them ideas and say, we tell them, hey, this is what we're trying to do. Uh, and uh, we're going to do it for the good of the community. But why don't you take credit for it? So by doing that, they actually help us spread what we want to do uh, and get buy-in from the community. So it's kind of a... Uh, a two-way street of uh, of um, of communication, but we but it's managed, and we manage it that way. And just a quick comment on this: I think it's so important, and as architects, you have to think about your communities, and you have to take their input into mind. Um, but when you enter uh, your practices or developers, what you'll realize is the time, cost of money, and opportunity costs are huge. I mean, these projects we're talking hundreds of millions of dollars, billions of dollars in some cases. And, um, you know, a day's worth of interest, uh, like the interest rate on, on that is a, is a lot of money. So um, in reality, there, you know, while we all want to do that and, you know, I'm all for supporting communities, um, it has to be done in a very effective and sort of quick manner. Um, and sometimes you get to do more. Sometimes you get to do, you don't get to do as much. Um, so just in, in you know, in a business context, um, there, there's so much more that comes into this than just, you know, what is that ideal level of integration and communication uh, and feedback from your community? So I want to, um, we can indulge for an, another 10 minutes or so. Um, I want to shift to kind of, um, we're an architecture school, um, but we're very interested in the capaciousness of our students and faculty around, um, you know, making the ideation of concepts uh, 
design concepts come alive um, at, at much smaller scales in some cases, um, aspirationally than, than the, the work that, the great work that you, you all are doing. But also, um, you know, we're, I think the beautiful thing here is people can see an arc towards um, an aspiration of, of doing the kinds of projects that you're doing. But I'm wondering, I'm, I'm going to be haunted by our March to Death Valley slide from Stephen Wong. <laughs> that was a cautionary tale for, for architects. Um, and I want to maybe think about that in the context of, of, of our school and say, um, you know, we have a generation of students that, that are very interested in taking the strategies that you're using uh, and, and, and super, uh, the, the reverse of super scaling, bringing them down to a very small scale that they can actually develop within four or five years of being out of school um, with a, a small property. And I'm wondering what advice you have for um, starting uh, in uh, linking development and architecture in a small way um, um, with, and what kind of education you think uh, architects need to do that. Um, and I wonder if you have any, um, any thoughts on that. Uh, how much time do you have, uh, Dean Perry? I can go on for years on this. I, I, let me take a quick, quick step at this. I think it's really a process of actually exposing yourself to what you are passionate about. Um, everybody has a personality, you know, uh, in what we do, everything is in the details. So, so I think the first thing is don't lose the details. But in the meantime, keep track on the big picture as well. You know, in terms of development, I, I, I knew quite early on, I was not right for an architect who draws stairs every day for the next 30 years. And I was very interested in the process of building and making it happen. So development was the natural way to go. The question then becomes is how do I get there? So again, how do you eat an elephant? You know, so I decided to take it one bite at a time and also take the development route in building companies that does one project at a time. So obviously other people will have a different route. I think the key on that is really exposing yourself while you're in school to other disciplines that's happening around the world, be it digitization, be it urban planning, be it business school, be it music. Everything has a role to play in development. So, so I, I would suggest really a, a, a very interdisciplinary uh, mindset, expose yourself and really just don't rush it. You know, it's, it's, don't get to the IR as Kenny Riley said. So the minute you have an IR in mind, uh, you might as well get into a production line of just building projects for the sake of money. Uh, but what we do is actually much more lasting in terms of impact. So uh, you know, I tend to say this is a really optimization process into the skill set, building a team, rely on your team and do good work through time. I think that's really how I would advise and find your team early. Uh, there's a lot of trust in the team as well that you need to have. So we've seen massive urbanization in the markets that you you all work in. And I'm wondering, um, as you look at other Asian cities that aren't as developed as the ones that you're working in, um, and maybe not as, as prosperous, um, what are the lessons that they could take from um, the work that you've done and the, and the kind of um, accelerated pace of development um, that's happened in, uh, in Hong Kong and Shanghai in uh, Taipei? Um, I'm going to go first because uh, uh, our projects have ranges from very high budget to very low budget. And in Taiwan, most of the development of the money, of course, is in the North Taipei. But we've done projects sort of to the south of Taiwan, um, out, out, outlying islands, and very quickly it becomes very clear that we are really building in a whole new different culture. Um, the craft, is, there, there is no professional builder to speak of. You know, these are just local guys and putting things together. And I think so very quickly, you have to find a way to, to get the project to a certain level, but then you will find that these local forces, you can't beat. They're gonna build what they, uh, what they can and how they build. There's a whole culture of construction that will greatly impact the building. But, but I think I've learned that that could be of uh, great benefit. Like the, the boutique uh, uh, resort that we just completed, it's done, um, extremely rough in terms of construction because we had known this uh, as a fact that we must accept from day one. So we kind of built into that sort of uh, vibe 
uh, as a kind of main characteristic of the building. You know, the concrete is like super rough, there is no interior, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but then really to focus on creating a strong identity and a story uh, within, within that beautiful nature. You know, I was looking at um, countries like Uruguay where they don't have a lot of money, but they're building fantastic buildings. Um, Mexico in the 60s, Brazil in the 70s. So I think um, as architects or, or maybe developers are always working with sort of these high end, high scale. But, but I think I've, I've worked with that, but I've also worked with very local and, and it does bring a very different characteristic. And, and I think I, it actually surprised me because then it would transform your building uh, to become a kind of different level. Um, so I think that is a good lesson to take. Um, wherever you work, it's going to be the, the same issues, but, but really the thing is to be very smart about uh, the resources that you can use. Um, you, you have to kind of go with the flow a bit, because if you fight it, then, then, then actually nothing will get done and everything turns negative very quickly. Um, so that's just from really practical experience. But having said that, of course, I don't mind having a huge budget to do more fantastic work. <laughs> Can I just put in one quick word as a developer? I think, um, you know, when I work with architects, the, the ones that I work best with and the ones that I found to be the most successful are the ones that listen, that really listen, um, who are taking your needs into account uh, as a business, right? You learn about uh, function and beauty, but you don't learn about return, right? And ultimately, the people who are paying you are looking for a return of some kind. It may not be financial, it may be community um, or something else, but um, you know, as, a, as an architect, you have to listen very well and be able to translate what you're hearing into that product that you're creating. Um, project, project management, the ability to manage resources and prioritize are just so important. And, um, you know, if you can really hone those skills uh, in school, you'll, you'll be a leg up when you graduate. Um, let, let me add my, my, my two cents worth is, you know, architecture is a service at the end of the day. Uh, while capital can go global and services are usually very locally delivered. Uh, I think we need to be, to be mindful. So I, I think just making sure that we are honed into what we can deliver consistently over time is actually critical. Great. I want to ask um, maybe the, the next to last question here. Uh, if there's no more questions. Please put questions in the, in the chat or the Q and A. Um, Adriel, I, I sensed a, a self critique of, of that project that was uh, near the canal and, and uh, perhaps uh, you would have done some things differently um, in terms of how you were dealing with uh, potentially um, flooding and so forth. And I'm wondering, um, you know, we look at something in the United States like Hudson Yards, which is uh, for us in the US a, a big project. Uh, um, that project came with massive uh, public investment uh, in the form of tax increment, uh, finance, and other, other kind of benefits. Um, but it also came with um, the task of, of taking um, a kind of unusable public right-of-way and infrastructure and upgrading it. And um, so I'm wondering if with the massive amounts of projects that flow in, massive amounts of money that flow into projects such as the ones you're doing, whether, um, you know, delving into that critique that you made of, of your own project, um, whether infrastructure is um, an additional role that very large scale projects can take on, um, adding some benefit to the public good while um, creating, you know, new environments, per, per, you know, potentially economic, e ecologically better environments, not only for that project, but also for neighboring projects in the entire waterfront. And I'm wondering if, if your critique is leading you to rethink the way in which you develop projects, particularly um, in contexts where the, the, the ecology is, is challenged or could be um, given the circumstances of what we're going through. Absolutely. Um, oftentimes in, when we take on projects, we're asked uh, either explicitly at the beginning or sometimes implicitly towards the end uh, to take on parts of the infrastructure. Um, you know, we're developing city blocks at a time, uh, in some cases, you know, more than a, a whole city block. And um, drainage, uh, electricity, you know, right of way, uh, automobiles, everything, uh, at least within the immediate vicinity, you have to consider. Um, if you don't have enough electricity, you know, we've been in positions many times where we actually build substations um, or the government 
uh, and in return for, you know, they can't pay up front, so it might be delayed uh, payment in form of tax breaks or things, things like that. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's, it has to be planned. It's all part of the earliest stages of your, your investment. You know, do you have enough uh, drainage? Do you have enough electricity? Um, what are the sunlighting implications um, for your neighbors? Because we build a lot of skyscrapers, uh, you know, uh, sunlight is a public good uh, and you have to respect that and you have to be cognizant of what your effect is on that. So these are all things that uh, do take place already. Um, there are codes in place. Uh, I think one of the things I think are most challenging is when those codes, uh, as well-meaning as they are, sometimes just aren't practical. Uh, you know, it's good when governments uh, have the ability to be flexible. Um, ultimately, we need to do things that are good for our communities because we're there for the long term. We build assets that are going to be there for 50, 100 years. Um, and if we're not good to our communities, how can we expect them to be good to us? Um, and infrastructure is an integral part of that. Thank you. Um, on that, I think we're going to close out. I want to thank um, Stephen, Grace, Adriel, and Kenny. Um, for really some amazing uh, projects and some amazing thinking um, in the work that you're doing. And I really appreciate um, the time I've spent with you um, uh, in, in Asia uh, has been, has been mind blowing. And, and I think uh, I look forward to continuing the relationship with the school and, and what we're doing with our students. And as we move forward with this initiative, um, I really, um, would appreciate your continued involvement with us because I think um, all of the points that we discussed today um, warrant longer conversations, um, studios, um, faculty engagement. Um, so we're so indebted to you for taking the time today to be with us and really look forward to continuing the conversation. So thank you for joining us. Um, tune in next week for, I feel like I'm on television. Tune in next week for our, uh, our next uh, lecture by Catherine Sievert Norton. Catherine Sievert Nordenson, uh, who will be talking about her work in landscape architecture. And um, thank you for all for joining us. Good night.